Welcome to the Vortex Nation podcast, brought to you by lovers of hunting, shooting, public lands, the Second Amendment, and good food. All right, what's up, everybody? Uh, you probably didn't get to see, and that's a good thing. The Oh, no, we have video. We'll post it. Oh, good, Eric. Oh, great. You will get to see the, the me setting up of the podcast uh, equipment. And, and by me, I mean uh, mostly Aaron, who's snapping some photos right now. Because, uh, well, we, uh, we struggled a little bit. I struggled a little bit. There's lots of wires. This is MC Ryan's uh, forte. He's a master at it. Basically, anything with electronics, I shouldn't be allowed to touch. But I don't know. You did work the lock pretty good on the door this morning. After the third attempt, we got in this this room. That was good. Yeah, left door. Um, anyway, so, but I think all these point to uh, a single contributing factor. And that factor is, I have not had a cup of coffee this morning. I think, Sawyer, you're in the same boat. My shirt's on backwards. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I need caffeine. A, 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 a lot of us start our day this way. I know I do, but I've been I've been saving myself for this moment right now, and uh, that's because I've got Eric to my right, Sawyer across the table, and we're joined by Tony from uh, Dark Timber Coffee, from slash owner, entrepreneur, coffee roasting master, coffee any, drinker, coffee, coffee drinker, drinker man, like, yeah, <laughs> consumer, consumer, yeah, yeah. customer, customer. Uh, so Tony, if you can introduce yourself, and actually before we do that, back up a sec. What we're going to talk about today is pretty much everything coffee, and what goes into making a good cup of coffee, and, and that's how why to get we, that buzz, and how to mm-hmm. get that buzz. I need to, Tony. I need to hit zero. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always chasing that next high. Yep. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sick, dragon. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little about yourself and and, and Dark Timber. Yeah, uh, my name's Tony, owner of Dark Timber Coffee. Dark Timber's been around for about three years, uh, but I've been in the coffee industry of almost 20. Right. right. As a master roaster director of coffee. So all that history goes into Dark Timber. We mainly specialize in backcountry style coffee products, uh, gravity packs, vapor packs, things like that. Um, we also source and roast all our own uh, coffee. We, we source from all around the world, uh, import it, and, and roast it in a roastery. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. In a nutshell, that's kind of so, and I think, you know, you're originally from kind of the, the, the PN dub, right? Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Born and raised in King County, actually. Which is kind of, and so that's kind of my, my OG neck of the woods. But it's, that's kind of, I feel like that's kind of like a, a coffee epicenter of kind of where a lot of, you know, this transition from, you know, maybe buying a, a can of Folgers or instant coffee. Yeah. And then, you know, the probably the concept of paying five bucks for a cup of coffee was like, you know, just completely asinine nobody would and now it's just commonplace now yeah it's so kind of like grew up in that coffee culture yeah that sort of um espresso culture like milk-based espresso drinks was basically popularized in seattle mm-hmm. starbucks um, a lot of those wet whisker a lot of those like og kind of kind of coffee companies and then there's what's called third wave coffee which originated in seattle as well which was like that next up above which was single origin coffees getting a little bit more in tune with you know for sort of a farm to cup mm-hmm. pro, you know style of coffee um starting to you know control all the variables in terms of like espresso preparation yep. whether it's freshness of your coffee that you're using uh, the roast styles that you're using temperature you know, mm-hmm. pressure, things like that. Hmm. Uh, that all kind of, you know, started in Seattle with Vivace Coffee, really. Yeah. Uh, Mark Stromer. Interesting. When did you have your first cup of coffee? Do you, oh, do you remember this pivotal <laughs> moment in your I do. You life? know, our family <laughs> had a, a deli in downtown Seattle on Dearborn Street. And this was back probably, um, gosh, 91, I yeah. would say, 92. And um, it was kind of right when espresso was being popular, right? So we had an espresso machine in the deli. So it was a sausage company. So we made copa and pepperoni yeah. and things like that. But in the front, um, there was you could go in and get a sandwich or you could buy pepperoni ends or, or things like that. We had an espresso machine there. So I was always sort of obsessed with that machine and, and constantly monkeying with it and everything. So mm-hmm. uh, I, get, I guess that was a, the first time I had espresso, but it's also the first time that I... Uh, Made an espresso drink yeah. too. Oh, okay. Was like, did you like it the first time you had it? Uh, it wasn't what I thought it was gonna be, but I didn't. It didn't turn me away from it. Yeah, I remember as a kid. I think we were at like the some office, right? And my mom had a cup of coffee, and I was like, oh, I can have a. I want one of those, you know. Yeah. She's like, You don't want one of those. I'm like, No, I want one of those. And she's like, Fine. So she's like, Fine. 
you can have a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was probably like, I don't know, six, seven. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we lad. I, th- I think she was. Um, I think she was anticipating that I'd be like, ugh, yuck, yeah. disgusting. Loved it. I loved it. Oh, <laughs> one <man>. of another. <laughs> you animal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had coffee growing up. I had coffee on Saturday mornings when I was in like grade school. Oh, <laughs> man. Really? <laughs> you're Rock so, and yeah. you're so sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a We're, that's a very nice word for it. Yeah. I don't even remember why I did. Yeah. I think I just liked it. Yeah, five year old yeah. Sawyer's got to surprise me. Just got his <laughs> nose buried in the stock market <laughs> section. Uh, just <laughs> wired doing the New York Times crossword. Yeah. Like. I have never met someone more dependent on it than, than you. I think yeah. like when you don't get your coffee in the morning, it's like oh man, there might this guy might be ill. Yep. <laughs> yep. It probably it is a dependency. So like, let's talk. I, let's oh, talk oh about God. that though. Like, no doubt. Like, is is that legitimate that it is a dependency, or is that like a placebo? I think effect? think on a certain level, right? There's yeah. some dependence to it, a reliance on okay. it, right? And then there's like the like the ritual of it, yeah, more so than a lot of like like if you didn't have coffee yet, or, you know, caffeine or whatever yet, you might have a headache or something. Yeah. But you know, try going with decaf for a few days and. See what that does. Might be psychosomatic, oh, man, right? Like a, it's a cultural right. norm too. Yeah. So it's it's just like the normal thing to do. Like you wake up, you have a cup of coffee. Like mm-hmm. it's just yeah. become so like ingrained in like professional culture yeah. as a whole. It's yeah. just like the normal thing to do. Well, and yeah. I was even talking to a buddy of mine who's in sports medicine, and he was saying like for workout regimens in the morning, like if you're someone who works out in the morning and you drink just like I don't know, like a cup of coffee mm-hmm. about 20 minutes before before your workout, it'll help you get that perceived energy boost right. that propels you through a workout. And I think that can be translated, whether it's workout, hunting, setting up the podcast machine, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, I think having that, getting that little, little bump, if yeah. you will, well, I think goes a long way for folks. It does. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. You I know, I think coffee is really what's driven America, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh Yeah. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, man. That's I'm, the sound bite we're gonna chop I'm out. I'm like when we <laughs> waving the flag. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I've a couple times, like whatever, something's going on in the morning. Maybe I haven't had enough coffee, but I actually, you know, you talk about a ritual. Like mm-hmm. I have a cup of coffee in the morning, and then I pour myself a Yeti cup of coffee, and then I uh, have an open top. So that's the one that's, that gets nice and cool on my way to work. Yeah. But like there, there was one time where like. I was driving to work and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And I'm like, what's wrong? Like, and I had forgotten my coffee. The world might as well have been spinning the wrong direction. Like <laughs> everything was yeah. anyway, it's important. Everybody start drinking coffee. Yeah. yeah. If you're yeah. not, you need to yep. fix yourself. Join fix. us. <laughs> yeah. Join us. <laughs> but so, so yeah, I mean, we're talking about, you know, kind of like this, this coffee culture and, and, and everything goes into it. And I mean, I was trying to write some stuff down. You're talking about, you know, single origin, Mm -hmm. proper temps, just everything that goes into that. So like what, you know, maybe explain maybe even like the life cycle of a coffee bean. So people can kind of like figure out like, where's exactly, you know, you know, a regionally or, you know, world in the world, where is it coming from? Right. And then like that process and then, you know, you sourcing it, getting it here, roasting it, you know, how long does a green coffee bean stay good for, mm-hmm. you know, once you get it here, all that yeah. good stuff. So, it's a lot of information, but we'll start uh, where it's grown. So majority of the coffee in the world that's harvested and imported or uh, exported uh, is coming from Brazil, right? So that's the number one main export of coffee or, or production of coffee. And then it's grown all the way through Latin America, Mexico, and there's a little bit actually grown in the United States, uh, Southern California on the coast there. Hmm, sure. Uh, they're growing a little bit over there. Um, it does okay, but it's in terms of production, I don't, there's not much there. And is that, a, is that a soil type that's more conducive to coffee climate. or climate? Mm-hmm. It's climate. Hmm. So you can't have frost. Frost will kill coffee. Yeah. Okay. So anywhere you have frost, you can't grow coffee. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you could you could grow coffee, one, in your house. Yeah, right? yeah. Two, in a uh, greenhouse situation, right. right, where you're controlling the climate inside the thing, right? But um, in terms of a yield on something like that, you, it would never be viable. Yeah. You know, maybe as a, you're consuming the coffee that's coming off those trees, but not as a sort of means of production for the market. Interesting. Yeah. And then it's also grown East Africa, Countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, um, they're big uh, uh, coffee production countries. And that's kind of where the story is where the, the coffee originated from. Okay. So like when we use Yurgachev heirloom coffees, that means that like 
that's kind of the the original coffee um, sort of from that region, hmm. right? So it's not like crossbred and things like that for production in, in a certain area. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And then will, like, the different soils in these areas affect the, the ultimate flavor of mm-hmm. the bean or what yeah. you get out of that bean? Yeah. So where they're grown, like, um, the, the soils, the climate, the regions will all impart a certain flavor on that coffee, right? So if you think about a, a Guatemala, Hue Hue Tenango, uh, or an Antigua, those are going to have a very s- distinct flavor, right? And then you talk about an Ethiopian Yurgachev. That has its own flavor unto itself. Like, you won't ever really find a coffee that's going to taste like that. So, like, when I taste that flavor, I know exactly what that is, you know. So, yeah, each individual area is going to have its own little flavor on the coffee. And then how it's cultivated and how it's grown by the farmer, yeah. you know, has a big uh, impact on the flavor itself. Yeah. Right? So, if a farmer's taking really good care of that coffee knows how it wants to grow in that area. It can really yeah. um, have its own distinct flavor. So what and then there's there's different strains like Mundo Novo, and yeah. different strains of coffee that's going to have its own kind of cup profile. Hmm. Okay, gotcha. So once you once you, you know you get it, and let, like let's say we're sitting here right now, we've got the gravity packs in front of us. When you're serving coffee, you know at at home or at mm-hmm. the office, whatever. What are the things that you can do that impact flavor? Because you touched on temperature there, yep. and I feel like that's one that I've heard a lot. Like, you don't want to serve it too hot because then it'll be burned. Yeah. Could you just kind of elaborate on that? Like, what is that sweet spot of temperature? Temperature, what, like yeah. 180 for drip coffee. Okay. Yeah, you want that end product to be coming out at 180. It can start out at 200, but once it hits, like, cold mugs or, or cold uh, carafes or things like that, you yeah. want that temperature to kind of drop. You don't want the water going into the coffee to be towards boiling, Right, because yeah. then mm-hmm. you're going to be burning that coffee. Yeah, uh, it's going to taste burnt. It's yep. it's not going to taste good. If it's cooler than 180 or something at brewing, you know, as it's brewing, you're not going to be extracting those flavors and those compounds that you want yeah. in the coffee. That's going to give it that that flavor that you're looking for. Yeah. It's what's going to be called under extracted. It's okay. a really good tip for like French press. A lot of people think French it's got to go boiling. No, no, no. Straight to the craft. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a good tip. Yeah, mm-hmm. just invest in a little meat thermometer or something that'll yeah. get to that temperature. Make sure it's calibrated in ice water or something, and, and yeah. just make sure you're testing that water if you want to get that nerdy with it. Yeah, you know? yeah, interesting. I do want to. I do want to back up here in a minute and kind of talk about like that. You know that path that the coffee takes before you uh, brew it. But um, while we're on this, one thing I w- want to talk about like water. Like mm-hmm. the water you use, yep. I mean, is that going to affect, you know, the flavor of your coffee and absolutely. the end product? Yeah, absolutely. If you live in a hard water area, Texas, Dallas, all mm-hmm. that, you're going to have a lot of uh, heavy stuff in your water, minerals, calcium. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really hard there because it's coming from the ground out of these like aquifers in the ground, you know. Mm-hmm. It's full of all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, places like Washington, that water's coming right off a glacier or off a mountain, right? That, that water's mm-hmm. really clean, really fresh. You don't really don't have to use any sort of filtering system or reverse osmosis system there, mm-hmm. but in the southern southern states or kind of in a little bit, and your water's a little sketchy. You might want to treat it or use like a bottled water. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then a like, drinking water, not like yeah. A, right? Okay, that's what I didn't ask. Is that like you need to see the different types of water at the store? Mm-hmm. You know, like so, like just drinking water. There. Yeah, like a drinking water, like 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 a distilled water. Or yeah, something, yeah, you know, like that. And that's okay. why people's coffee makers get all gunked up too, exactly. right? Like yeah. that's a that's a good a that, good tip that you should use different water. Yeah. So if you are, if you do like uh, invest in, like in your kitchen with a nice coffee brewer, like a Breville or something yeah. that's a little bit up there, uh, like a five hundred dollar above coffee mm-hmm. brewer, invest in at least a one can uh, filter system. Okay. Hmm. You know, just something that's going to take that hard water down a little yeah. bit because you're going to be throwing your money away. And how do you clean that? Let's say you do get it gunked up a little bit, like you're saying. How do you clean that out? Citric acid. Okay. Yeah. That's going to take out that cal- those calcium deposits, gotcha. which is going to gunk up all the moving parts. Yeah. Yeah. I've used vinegar. That's yeah. A, so that's, I'd, I'd rather use citric acid, though. Yeah, that's vinegar, I w- it's going to be in there a little bit. Yeah. You know, that yeah. stuff, citric acid, really has no flavor. It's going to impart on... Yeah. The parts itself. So like a puro calf is one to use, right? And just yeah. work that through your, you know, make a pot of coffee, you know, with something, you know, and send that stuff through that are in the water or yeah. something. Um, you can get little like cleaning pills, you know, that'll right. show you how to do it. Um, What's really interesting on that is like when you, you know, my, my wife cleans ours out with vinegar, I think. Mm-hmm. And before she cleans it out, it'll 
it's amazing how much more efficient the machine runs after Absolutely. the fact. Right. Yeah. You can tell when it needs to get cleaned out, like when it's it sounds like it's getting ready to take off. Uh-huh. And then you you know, <laughs> like she'll clean it out and she'll do like two cycles cleaning it out or whatever. And then it's unbelievable. Like that next morning when the coffee machine starts going, you don't even hear it because mm-hmm. it's just running so efficiently. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the day before when it was gunked up, it's just like it's you hear every groan and moan of that thing. It's like, yeah. So, yeah, that pressure's building up because it's hitting some resistance and it's like, yeah, yeah. yep. Interesting. May want to use some drinking water though, Eric. Yeah. Change change the flavor of that cup of coffee. Just go to the Cull again and get those bottled waters and get yourself a flow jet coming off it. And there you go. There you go. So, getting back, I know we're jumping around here, but I just find the whole coffee process you know a to z start to finish just fascinating but you know whether you buy you know whole beans or or ground coffee at the store you know it's kind of this this finished product yeah. right it definitely doesn't start off that way not at all and so like we call it a a, a bean but explain like the coffee as it's grown i mean people call it like a, a cherry i think yeah it or actually yeah that's is the it, fruit. Is it, or is it more of a yeah. pit than a it's a seed yeah it's, it's a, a seed. pit yeah i mean the 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 name bean has just been around forever right so yeah. it's just used i sometimes will say seed to a customer and they'll look at me with this like very glazed over funny look uh, trying to figure it out yeah. uh, so then i just revert back to saying bean right right, right. know it but it's actually a, se- a seed a pit of, yeah. of a coffee cherry which is the fruit right <laughs> So when a coffee plant, it blooms once a year, sometimes twice, Mm -hmm. right? And it's force flowered by water. Mm -hmm. Uh, And once it's flowered, these little white flowers appear on the plant and then they sort of drop off, get pollinated. And then uh, these little green cherries start to emerge and they turn red or yellow or orange, depending on what it is, uh, what what strain it is. And then inside that cherry uh, are usually two beans, Right, mm-hmm. flat sides. If you can think of a coffee bean, the flat sides are together like that, and it makes okay. sort of an oval yep. right inside. And sometimes there's what's called a pea berry, right? And a pea berry is inside that cherry. There's one seed, right? And it's a mutation within that that hmm. that plant that's going to produce that that sort of one seed. And okay. those are really coveted. They, they'll get sorted out by the pickers after you know it goes through um, its processes, uh, and then those are bagged up on their own. Uh, and sold off. Is that more an aesthetic or is there a flavor? flavor? Yeah. So think of like, uh, if you think of like two coffee seeds, right. Mm -hmm. Getting all that energy from the plant and all that, uh, you know, from, uh, flavor from the cherry and all that. Okay. With a pea berry, it's sort of one compacted into that, you know, all that compacted into that one pea berry or Mm -hmm. that one seed. So it's tends to be more flavorful, right. So Mm -hmm. the more sought after, like a Kenyan pea berry is a big one. So is okay. a pea berry? Tanzania pea berry is a very sought after coffee, very expensive coffee sometimes. Hmm. So is the pea berry smaller than the sum of the two parts? Like, yep. it, is it quite a bit smaller? It can be, yes. The pea berries can range in screen size. Screen sizing is like the size of the, the seed itself. They can be very small uh, or they can be somewhat large. Depending. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Every plant's going to produce uh, pea berries. Okay. Uh, um, just some will produce more. Interesting. How, how many cherries, on average, are like on a coffee on a coffee tree? Uh, yeah, it depends uh, on the production coffee plant itself. So it's okay. going to vary from plant to plant and how they are taking care of the plants. So like every two years, are they cutting them back and letting them regrow? Mm-hmm. Right, and then they're going to be stronger. They're going to produce more. But if they let it go, right, and it's just the same trees for thirty years that production on those trees is going to start shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So let's say it's a coffee plant that's at its maximum production. Okay. You know, you're going to get thousands Okay. You know, of coffee cherries off that within its full uh, cycle. Okay. Right? So it's full growing season from start to finish because they don't all kind of ripen at once, right? And they're all, you know, they'll go back through and yeah. harvest more and harvest more unless they're mechanically harvested. Okay. So does a coffee tree need a lot from the kind of soil and the ecosystem? Because like a parallel, I was thinking about in Wisconsin, like farmers will grow corn one year and then switch to beans because it takes a different thing out of the soil. So is there anything like that or is it just kind of... No, coffee plants, there's a huge time investment in it, right? So a coffee plant won't even produce coffee in a harvestable amount for three years. Oh, wow. Right? So you have to plant that and it's it's going to take a long time. So it's not like something where they're going to switch crops or something, or, or there's, you know, to regenerate yeah. whatever's in the soil. 
these plants are grown and then they're there for 30 years. So it's an then, investment if you're trying to do a startup coffee mm-hmm. farm. like Yeah, and that's why, you know, when you have... <laughs> the first three years might be a little rough. Get some angel yeah. investors or something. You <laughs> yeah, know? You know, that's, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, once you get it going, then you can start, you right. know, f- figuring out. But, uh, but yeah, so that's why when there's things that happen, like, um, like a frost goes through Brazil and burns the, burns yeah. the trees, uh, that's why the market just... It just skyrockets Man. or something. So are they back to square one then? It depends on what happens. So oh, like when I go to Brazil, I can still see some of the prior frost. So you look at the hills and yeah. and the you know there'll be like a little draw that comes down the mountain and the way that that cold air sits and collects and then turns into frost. It'll just be burned. You know, burn that is in like brown. Yeah, yeah. Right. You, know, you see these brown, brown uh, sort of strips coming down wow. the mountain. Jeez, that's and then wild. does that? kill the actual plant or just the crop can. for that year yeah it can depends on if that plant's going to come back or not depending on how hard that frost was okay if it's a day of frost yeah probably not that bad if it's a week of frost or if it's prolonged frost then and now is that is the biggest risk risk there only frost during the growing season or no, is it there's lots of it there's yeah. la roya la roya hit 2014 15 there's still mm. impacts from that. Yeah. Guatemala, all those, you know, Panama all through yeah. there, Costa Rica. Uh, it's La Roya is a coffee rust. It's okay. a fungal infection of the coffee, and it killed a lot of coffee plants, and it hurt a lot of farmers. Uh, so that's another one. Yeah, because I'm trying to draw parallels there to, like, apple trees. You know, like at home, you know, in, in the Midwest, we, you know, if you have uh, hard frost that comes in in early May after your apples bloom, you know, it might zap it that year, and you'll have a year of really bad apple crop. Right. But then but, the very next year, if you've got better growing conditions, you're good to go. And it yeah. sounds like this isn't it's, the case. Yeah, well, yeah, not with La Roya. Yeah. La Roya's, yeah, they're bad. I mean, they, like, they call the, uh, I think it's Costa Rica, it was, you know, it's pretty bad. Is there a way to combat it, or it's just yeah, like... Yeah, they it, have to use uh, fungicides and things, Okay, you know, which people look down on, but right. I see it as it's a means of, like, okay, battle it, you know. Right, right. So how big, you know, we're talking about comparisons, like how big is a coffee tree? Like, let's say a mature, it can be, it can be three foot or it can be 15 foot. Okay. Yeah. It can go quite a bit. Shade grown coffee tends to grow taller. Okay. Um, Because it's stretching for light always, you know, so it tends to get big because it's looking for that light. And what's the life cycle of a coffee tree producing beans? Is it like in its maximum production? Yeah. In perpetuity? It it depends on if they're cutting them back every couple of years, right? And they're really doing a good job at taking care of these plants and if they just let them go. Yeah. If they're really taking care of them, you know, they'll have to rip them out every 20, 30 years. Really? Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. But if they're not taking care of them, they're just letting them kind of grow. So their maximum production is just going to be down. That's interesting. Are they they a pretty quick growing tree then? No, they're slow growing. Really? Man, that's interesting. Because I'm like, like you compare that to an oak. In an oak, you know. It's not that slow. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. No, in comparison to a hardwood or something. No, no. Okay. These grow much faster. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, You're not necessarily comparing apples to apples there. No. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So and then and then so and then harvesting these cherries mm-hmm. is it a consistent time of year for everybody? Is it like every spring, every summer, every fall? No, is it, you can, have like as you go in more north. You know, th- there's different harvest times, right? There's the bulk of the harvest that comes out, Colombia, Brazil, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. That's the bulk of the stuff that's going to come out, uh, and that stuff will start happening in April. You know, into June, you know, yeah. we'll start getting most of it out of there. Columbia's got a, a double harvest. They'll have two harvest seasons just because of the climate in hmm. there and, you know, where they're at. Okay. Um, but it's mainly, f- like I said, forced by rains, forced okay. by the rainy season. The plants have water now, so once they have mm-hmm. water, then they're going to start producing their fruit. Okay. So once the harvest happens, right, and, you know, that can, like I said, change from East Africa or, you know, even the Asian countries that are, that are producing coffee, that can all be different. But for the main coffee, it's like in that April you know, gotcha. through, it's through into September yeah. kind of thing. But yeah, so once that coffee gets harvested and it's, you know, whether it's mechanical, mechanical harvesting goes through and they use big tractors similar to like, a, like a car wash almost. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I got to drive one time. It was kind of fun. Heck but, yeah. Uh, but what it is, it's this giant tractor kind of on stilts, right? And there's four posts and there's wheels at the four posts mm-hmm. on the bottom. And then they drive the row of coffee through the, the center of the machine and middle of the machine. There's like two giant tall bristles like okay. even like in a car wash they would like, mm-hmm. spin and what that does is it like knocks all the cherries off the plants kind of strips the uh, strips the 
branches. Yeah. Right. And they all kind of go one direction and it just like sloughs mm. all the all the cherries off and yeah. they're collected at the bottom into an auger and the auger puts it into a, a trailing cart. So if it's like that, then they go in once, right? Okay. Because they're right. taking good, bad, whatever. Right. Typically, if you're going to see mechanically harvested coffee, that's going to be your lower grade specialty or macro. Yeah, your your commodity coffees right. harvested that way yeah. a lot, right? So they just want a ton of coffee. They're, yeah, they're trying to harvest tonnage. Okay. So if it's selected harvest, you know they'll go in, take all the ripe cherries, uh, come back in ten days later, take the next round, the next round, the next round until there's not really enough more, you know, enough there to, yeah, you know, make it worthwhile to go and get them, and then those hit the ground. But Interesting. When you're doing the more, or when someone's doing the more mechanized harvest, you know, like you said, you're, you're getting cherries of, I guess, varying ripeness, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Are all those, is it just like a mixed bag going into that end product then? Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it'll be sorted after the fact, right? Okay. So some of these co-ops, uh, especially in Brazil, they're big down there, big co-ops. They'll have magic eye machines uh, or they'll sort them out at the mill. You know, they'll, they'll set them into the water, floaters go, sinkers stay cherry you know if it floats it's got gas in it if it mm-hmm. sinks there's no gas which means there's no rotting going on no decomposition going on okay okay um so they can get sorted that way but a lot of times with mechanically harvested coffee it's just commodity coffee so okay. it's that stuff you see at the store that's six bucks a bag mm-hmm. um stuff gotcha. like that pre-ground six bu- six dollar coffee that's that's what that is and there's companies that want tonnage you know, right. they, you know i need you know 1.5 million pounds of that coffee. Yeah. No one's going to sort that. What the heck's a magic eye? A magic eye is it sends all the <laughs> finished green coffee. Am I, am I the only one in the room? <laughs> the magic eye is a, it's a crazy machine. And, and, uh, every time I see it or, or go stand up there and look at it, it, it always boggles my mind. But what it is, is it's a machine. So you have the, you have the cured coffee seeds, beans, right? Green. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're in a hopper and then it feeds, uh, that hopper feeds down through a machine that has these little channels through the machine, right? And there's, mm-hmm. there's hundreds of thousands of these little channels mm-hmm. and at every little channel, there's a inspection eye, like a sensor. Oh my and what happens is if it sees a color it doesn't like or something by the time it, it's, it senses it here. And by the time it knows the speed at which that coffee seed or that bean is dropping. Yeah. And it knows that once it gets to right here, it's going to, you know, it's going to like hit it with a little blast of air. Hmm. So it just kicks it out. So it's like, it, it's just this, it's faster than you can even blink. All you see that's is wild. beans flying everywhere as this coffee's coming down and that's how they're sorting. Yeah. It. So they're getting rid of all the sours, all the, you know, the darker ones and under ripes, over ripes. Okay. Huh. Interesting. You know, broke a damaged coffee, things like that. Has technology gone too far? <laughs> <laughs> not with coffee, not with that, not with those things. Yeah, <laughs> we're all benefiting. That's yeah. That, that's that's one where I'm okay with yeah. it. Yeah. I don't think that thing's really taking anybody's job. No, yeah. no, <laughs> <laughs> not a job anyone would want. Yeah, yeah. no. I yeah. used to do it with a loop, actually. Yeah, yeah, um, a straw. <laughs> so and then they dry it, or how do they? How yeah. are they removing so the, a, is yeah. it a husk, or what would you call the so. From the plant, it gets harvested, right? Mm-hmm. The cherries get harvested. The pickers put them into their pa- the pails, and the, the harvesters are paid by the pail, right? They're volumetrically paid. Okay. So they they go up once they have their full sacks or whatever. Then they go up and they're they're leveled off and they're paid by how much they're harvested. Then that coffee goes to the mill, mm-hmm. right? Or it goes to the patio. Most of the time, it'll go to the patio for a little while. But uh, if it goes straight to the patio to dry, that's called a natural process. Okay. Right. So they're drying that with the coffee. I think cherry. I've seen pictures of that where it's just kind Cherries. of like, yeah, spread yeah. out. Yeah. Like almost on the ground. Just yeah, it is on the ground. Dry. Yeah. It's just sun dried, sun yeah. cured. Yeah. Um, so that's one process, right? So and from there it'll go to get hold, right, uh, and husked. So what it does is it goes into a machine, and at the top of the machine it has these little like hammers like this, and they're really fast, and you set the tolerance to how big that cherry is for the day or mm-hmm. for whatever's coming off your plants, and it's just gonna break that open right and then it'll down at the bottom it'll kind of get hold off uh, and mm-hmm. then you have your your seed your bean can those husks be used as, as compost do they mm-hmm. reuse they go back it? out okay. yeah That's and cool. then the cherry itself's now getting sold to cascara yeah. cascara tea um, they're reusing it as that now yeah. this is a big thing or maybe it's not as big as it was when it first hit the market but okay yeah if you wanted like caffeine you know i had one question actually 
regarding the tree, are there birds or wildlife that eat coffee? Oh, like, yeah. Is, is that an issue mm-hmm. for growers? No, nah, not really. Just because of the scale? Yeah. No, they're not out there like shooting the birds and putting scarecrows out or anything. Yeah. I swear I read an article. Were you, look, were you looking for another hunt opportunity, Sawyer? <laughs> uh-huh. Hey, if they need some help. <laughs> um, I was reading an article about a certain type of coffee. It was like hundreds of dollars an ounce about it was this animal that eats a coffee bean. Civets. It's a civet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, yeah. Do you know about, can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, I won't drink it. Yeah, I've never I don't, drink it I don't and, blame I, you. and I yeah. won't drink it. One, it's extremely inhumane to those animals. They keep them in cages and mm-hmm. just feed them coffee by the bucket all day long. And they're in a cage that's open, you know, that's wire. Yeah. And then at the bottom, they collect the excrement and, and then they wash it, roast it, and you drink it. I did see this article. Right? It's it's cat poop. Yeah. Like, you can't, I don't care how you're going to sell that to me. Right. I'm not drinking that. You know what I mean? That's just and not they put something. A, pr- a premium price on that. It's premium price because how much can that yeah. cat. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. How much can it? How much can it eat in a day and and, and, and expel in a day? Right. Jeez. So it's not like they can make this on a mass civet cat scale. Yeah. It's yeah. Called we Copy Luwak coffee. That's, that's, we don't have to get into it. I was just wondering because that's I remember reading about that and thinking, wow. Yeah. That's, and I'd I'd heard about it. I didn't realize the process was um, feeding it and collecting. Yeah. It. Like yeah. I thought it was uh, you just you know go to this area and collect these wild... Keep, keep, I think at one this, point, this maybe it was like matter. that. There was, there was uh, you know, like maybe some collection and harvesting of, of wild piles. Okay. Right? But now it's not. I mean, it's it's a, an economy. You know what who I, you need to get on the podcast after the follow-up this coffee one? The first guy who ate cat poop coffee. Right. He's the, like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to... Get some hot water. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna clean off that poop, and I'm gonna drink that. I've never seen. I've never seen cat poop and gone. I've got an idea. <laughs> right. What yeah, a crazy. He was either like really hungry or something. <laughs> yeah. You know. Hey, it worked for him. Desperate yeah. times, man. Now he's a millionaire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, I got all these cats running around. I got to do something with this. <laughs> yeah. All this poop around. Yeah. You want to buy it? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I didn't want to sidetrack him. <laughs> no, I, I, I did want to talk. I take. Small detour to cat poop coffee. No, I like I like that that box. I think we're good. Yeah, I like that subject because then I can really just shit on it. Yeah, (laughs) no no pun intended. Yeah, yeah, Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, where were we? (laughs) Coffee uh, production. Yes. Yes. So there's natural process, right? That's one style, and that's going to lend its, like, the flavor to uh, more fruity coffee, right? So you get that, like, cherry note, that blueberry in a coffee that's really strong and forward. Typically, it's going to be a natural process coffee, right? Because those juices of that coffee cherry and the the mucilage and everything, you know, from that are still on that that seed, right? They're not washed off. Yeah, okay. Right, so you're going to get that in the cup. So, like, we'll use some of those natural coffees in our blends just to give it that sort of little fruit note right. to it, right? It's, so on that note, how does the flavor of coffee change at, like with temperature? So we have a, a friend that, that we work with that brews coffee, and there's one specific brew that he does that he recommends when you pour it to let it cool off because then more of the notes come out of you, that. I do that with every coffee. Really? Yeah. Okay. Don't let it get too cold, but, yeah, you're going to want, you know, you're, you're going to want it to be in that, like, kind of 140 range. Yeah. Uh, temperature wise and what it does is one it's not burning your taste buds right 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 and two it's calmed down enough to where that you're not just noticing the heat and swallowing it. yeah you know it's like those things are like kind of coming forward all the different f- f- flavor notes so like when we grade coffee and cup coffees what we're doing um when we're grading those is you know one we're gonna we're gonna drink them at their optimal temperature right we're gonna get we a little spoon yep. and we're slurping and you know, maybe you guys are familiar with that process. Well, that's, but, uh, that's what I wanted to ask about was like that, that cupping process. Mm-hmm. Cause I mean, that seems like a, almost like a pretty crazy skill that a person it is. Has. Yeah. Yeah. It really takes years to really hone that skill and to, to know what you're tasting and especially with defects, like to be able to taste that defect and if it's super phenolic yeah. or something, you know, or, or that broken damage, you can start really tasting the broken. But what it is, the process is it's very simple, really. Right. So you have, uh, a series of of uh, sort of porcelain cups, like small, like almost like a soup bowl you would get at a restaurant. Oh, can I ask a question then? Uh-huh. Is porcelain like the optimal thing to drink a cup of coffee out of then? Uh, no. Or does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Just something that's not going to impart any, any like, flavors, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, like we use silver spoons because silver doesn't have a metal flavor. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't 
you're not like a tin or, or something like that. You know, you can use stainless steel, but we like to use silver spoons. Yeah. But we just use them, one, for their insulation properties, so they're going to insulate the coffee a little bit. You know, it's not going to go cold super quick. Like if it was in glass, right? glass, it would just go cold. Gotcha. Right? So they kind of insulate a little bit. But in terms of like perfect thing to drink out of, there's a lot. Okay. You know, but uh, so you have a series of cups, right? Uh, and what you're doing is you're adding ground coffee into, into these cups, and then you're adding water into hmm. the cups, right? And then they're going to do what's called blooming, right? So within co- roasted coffee, there's trapped gases okay. right, from the roasting process. And what happens when you're adding water to those, that coffee opens up and releases that gas, and then it does what's called a bloom. You guys are probably familiar with that. So we're going to let that coffee bloom, and then it's called, uh, then it has what's called what we call a crust, right? There's a crust on top. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, we're going to we're going to smell the coffee. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our spoon and we're going to break that crust with our noses really close to the crust. Okay. So we're like unlocking what's underneath. And we're smelling that, right? We're using our olfactory sense to like smell what's in there. We're, sm- we're smelling for any defects or you know anything that might we might taste later on in the coffee. Because sometimes we can smell it and then really we'll kick it away. You know, automatically, if we smell something that's really awful, we'll just know that coffee's not going to taste so that great. Is that blooming what almost looks like an oil slick on like the top of your glass, or is that something? No, else? it's it looks like like a rising of a dough. I know what you're talking about there, though. Like every now and then, when you pour a cup of coffee, you get that weird little like yeah, like an oil like, slick. There's just oils in it, right? Yeah, yeah there's know? oils in it. If you're getting a ton of oil yeah. in your coffee, that means you're over extracting it. Like if it's you can visually see like droplets almost, yeah. yeah it's so, over extraction. So over extracting is in like you're putting too much you're coffee, pushing too much out of that gotcha. coffee. Whether you know if you have espresso, yeah, and you see oil build up in espresso, it's that's gonna probably give you those bitter. So remedy that by ever. putting less coffee, in less the, coffee, gotcha. less temperature, less pressure. Like if you're tamping way too hard, yeah. uh, your coarseness of your coffee is probably too fine. Yep. And it's and it's not letting the right amount of uh, water go through, right? Yeah. Extraction times. That's another Jeez. really good tip. I was I was really just, good tip. Mm-hmm. I was just gonna ask that. Like, so so two things there. One, the how how coarse do you want to grind it if you're actually grinding it yourself? Depends on what your what brewing apparatus you're using. Yeah. So if you're doing like a French press, you want like fifteen hundred particulates per bean, right? And you're probably not gonna get a microscope out and count. Yeah. Right. How many pieces come off that bean? But you know you want it. Similar to like like coarse salt, okay, right? Yep. Somewhere where those particulates can't fit together. Yeah. Right? Okay. Right. So f- it's like so closely that it's gonna block, like almost clump. Yeah. Like yeah. Or like if you're using a French press, if they if they're too close together, they won't let you push down yeah. the plunger, right? Then you'll have to pull up the plungers a little bit, twist, and push down, pull, twist, push down, yeah. pull, twist, push down, so you can get it all the way to the bottom. Yeah. It's usually when you have that, it's it's too fine. Like and you kind of want to maintain almost like a semi-porous. Yeah, they, they you don't want them to fill your screen, right? right? To be small enough to fill the screen, right? You want them to be just big enough so they're just bigger than the holes in the screen, yeah. so that, you know you can you can plunge it. And then what's the best ratio of water to coffee? Man, that's that's a subject all in itself because yeah. it depends on the coffee, right? That you're using. Yeah, uh, that's gonna say how much you know coffee that you're gonna that you're gonna put in with the water. Right. Uh, you know, typically what I do for eight ounces of coffee is about twelve to thirteen grams. Okay. To eight to ten ounces. So okay. if you use that as a starting point, yeah. You know, and it's hard to say which. Like, if, if it's a super dark coffee, and you try to you know relate that to measuring in spoons. Mm-hmm. Right. It's hard because a lighter coffee is going to be less coffee, right? But it's going to weigh more than a dark coffee is going to be visually mm-hmm. more coffee and weigh less. So, okay, you know, it's hard to say in, in yeah. terms of like how many scoops from a spoon it's going to take. But right. in gram weights, that's that's usually what I recommend. Okay, okay. So cool. do you have like a scale then that you use? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a scale when we're brewing coffee. So just like that, like I touched on that third wave stuff, you're controlling every variable that goes into making that cup gotcha. of coffee because if there's something wrong. You right. can figure out where it's wrong, and you can fix it. Okay. Like, okay. Yeah, that's why, like, the main drawback on auto brewers and things is, like, you can't do that. Right. You right? can't pull out the You can't individual. pull out what's going on. You hmm. see, usually it's too hot of water, right? It's sort of more percolating than actually showering and things right. like that. But. So is there an official process or, like, community for kind of the things that you're talking about? Like, you think about, like, a sommelier for wine. Mm-hmm. Like, is there kind of that ingrained community where... There are certain 
like norms you have to check off these boxes to be considered like a coffee expert or is it more i mean you can like when i first started there wasn't right there wasn't any classes you could take right you couldn't go learn to be a roaster unless somebody taught you or like in my case you just bite the bullet and buy your equipment mm-hmm. and spend the year learning how to do yeah. it without letting anybody drink your coffee <laughs> you know but now you can go to cupping classes you can get these certifications but really it takes just time you know, mm-hmm. once you get to that level of like director of coffee uh, in, in your career in coffee, you've pretty much there. Director of coffee. Yeah. That is a title that oh, I man. would aspire have for. Change, I had that. Change my business cards, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> I had that title for 11 years. Dude, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah. That's 11 cool. years. Uh, another company, but. Well, let's, ju- let's jump back because I want to finish this cupping process. Yeah. So you, you've broken the crust. Mm hmm. You've uh, used your olfactory senses yep. to, like, you know, smell what uh-huh. either you what's think going should on be there, there or yeah. not be there. Yeah. And then what's going on so after So now that? Uh, you're going to get rid of the coffee grounds, for the most part, that's in the, in, okay. in the cups, right? So you're going to take two spoons, and you're going to put them sort of together, and you're going to run them around the side of the cup and start pulling out all the grounds, right? Get all the grounds mm-hmm. out of there so when you're slurping that coffee, you're not slurping these pieces of grounds at the back of your throat. Okay, right. Because it's right? like kind of like when I've seen it, on video, it's like kind of like a rapid. Like, yeah, you're, you're really slurping going for it. it. Yeah, so the reason why you're doing that is um, because you want to smell and taste at the same time. So okay. when you slurp, you're aerating that coffee in your mouth. Yeah. Right, and then now you can really taste. Uh, you can really taste that coffee. Yeah. Right? So all those flavors are really sort of magnified when you do that. Gotcha. Okay. And then, is there any process for transitioning from one to the next one to the next one? Or is it no? There is, like just yeah. There is new experience. Yeah. Like, so or could one like almost like tamper with the next one? Yeah. So what you do is you're gonna wash your spoons off. So you have you know they're they're you go down the line, right? And you only really do that when you have different coffees, right? Or like different lots. Like okay. say these two cups right here. This is one lot of coffee, uh, and then you know especially if you're like if you're at a co-op, okay. you're at, And you're you're going through lots of coffee. So uh, lots meaning like different batches of mm-hmm. green coffee i would say okay. or like different farms okay uh, and you're cupping them against each other okay right so you want to find the best one you'll have a couple you know like this these two cups here you always want to have two basically um, so you can try to see if they're consistent mm-hmm. uh, so you have two here two here two here two here then you have a glass of clean clean water so you'll go through one dip it get all the coffee from the last one off go into the next one and Okay. So on and so on and so on. And then there, you basically, there's a round table and you just keep going around and around and around the table as you're tasting these coffees and you've got your, yeah. note, you know, your notepad and you're sort of scoring these coffees as you go by and which ones you want to take a second look at and, you know, so forth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you're, you're drinking these coffees or degrading these coffees until they get cold. So you want to mm-hmm. drink them from their optimal temperature all the way down to cold pretty much. And oh, wow. see how that temperature change or how the how the flavor changes because as a lot of times with lower grade coffees as they get cold they start to get extremely undrinkable right right so a really high grade coffee a, a really nice coffee is going to be really good when it's hot and it's going to mm-hmm. be good when it's cold hmm. a lot of lower grade coffees will you know get bitter they'll get bitter or they'll get funky yeah you'll, you'll start to taste that those off flavors and those yeah. funky flavors in the coffee as it gets cold. Is there mm. something about a good blend that makes it better when it's cold? Is it just the quality of the, the quality bean of the coffee? It's a good in, good out situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting because, I mean, I generally, you know, drink good coffee, mm-hmm. like dark timber, and, like, oftentimes, like, I don't mind, like, let's say I pour a cup and I go do something, whatever, get distracted by the kids, I'll come back to it and I'll drink it cold yeah. and it's a completely enjoyable yeah, experience. Yeah, still good, right? Yeah, that means you're drinking a good yeah. coffee. Interesting. Yeah. What about reheating it? You know, uh, like... <laughs> not- I think that question is better for my mom than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's the queen of reheating coffee in the microwave. Yeah. Oh, my. Right. Yeah. Just, yeah. Oh. Because I can't well, imagine let's, let's that. Address that. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Let's address it. Yeah. Mom, can't if do. you're out there... Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, not going to be as good as when it was first yeah, hot. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So you would recommend if it's good coffee, just drinking it cold rather than reheating drink ju- it. Out make of yeah. just enough to drink it. Yeah. To drink, yeah. just like drink that. I mean, like don't make a full pot and then like go out back and microwave it, but to each their own, right? Yeah, I'm not going to tell yeah. you not to do it. You know, mm-hmm. coffee's coffee. You yeah. Drink coffee Cause something. I noticed that like when we brew up like a full pot and like, you know, maybe we drink two cups right off the bat. 
Then we go, you know, whatever, take the dog for a walk, come back 45 minutes later, we still got that pot on, and now we drink, or we pour another cup, totally different, you know, because mm-hmm. it's been sitting on there so long, and it's yep. gotten so hot, and it's probably burned. Oh, yeah, They're like so, diner coffee, we just call yeah. it like diner style uh, yes, coffee. Yes, exactly. Yeah, That's exactly. Where you have, like, you know, the just one brewer, but yep. then there's, like, nine burners attached to it, yeah. so there's, like, nine pots of coffee, uh, you know, so, like, each server can come up and grab one. Right. Yeah, it's that. Gotcha. Yeah, kind of burned. Yeah, you get it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, you're like, oh, I can taste the nostalgia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got to be in a tough spot to drink that coffee. Like, you really need it. You're, yeah. you're not in a you're good place when you're... You're out late the night before, yep. yeah. and you're at that diner in the morning yep. getting that greasy spoon food. Yep, yep. Do we dig in? I, I don't think it's a bad idea. Yeah. So, as we're doing this, so we're talking about, you know, I feel like we've kind of gotten there. So, it's like, so, so making up a coffee, cup of coffee. We're talking about the water the temperature, the coarseness of the grounds, and then I guess, you know, the process that you're going to brew that coffee. And I know when uh, we were at the uh, the BHA rendezvous a couple of years ago, you had this like Rube Goldberg <laughs> contraption yeah. to brew coffee. I think you yeah. called it like a, it was a, a vacuum. Uh, yeah, a siphon pot. A siphon pot. Yeah, it's a bean heater cipher, siphon pot. Okay. Yeah. That, seemed, that seemed like pro, that's my pro level. F- that's, yeah, that's probably like... My Director favorite of coffee cup of coffee is through that <laughs> siphon pot. And is that something where you're like, I've got the time? Yeah, that, that is a time investment, and it's very little output, right? It's pretty much like a European, South American sized cup of coffee. It's very small, okay. six ounces. And what's ha- what's happening in that process then? Yeah, so it's it's a really cool way to make coffee, right? So it's um, what it is. Um, I'm going to try to explain this. So people can visually see this in their heads, but. Uh, on the bottom, there's a round bulb, right, which mm-hmm. is full of co- full of water, about halfway. And then on top, if you can think of how a French press looks, mm-hmm. right, and sort of a cylinder, and at the bottom of the cylinder is a stem, right, like a tube, right? And then that top and tube go down into the water in the bulb, right? There's a rubber gasket right at the tube, and it, and it makes a seal. And then... Uh, that whole contraption has a handle and a foot base to it, and you slide that thing over a beam heater. Mm-hmm. You can use fire, um, which is the old way to do it, okay, uh, like a kerosene lamp kind of thing. But I have these, uh, or we have these uh, very expensive beam heaters from Japan, and it's more of a consistent, rapid heat. Uh, and you're heating up the water in that bulb, right? And when you heat water up, it creates vapor. Vapor creates pressure. Right, and there's nowhere for that pressure to go but push down, mm-hmm. and then it pushes the water up the stem and up into the mm-hmm. top carafe, right? And then at the bottom, there's the pressure is so high that no more water's left down there. It's all pushed up to the top, and then from there, you're gonna turn down the the heat just a little bit, just enough to keep that pressure there, so it's not rolling anymore. Then you're gonna add your coffee, you're gonna stir, and then it's just like a French press. It's full immersion. That coffee is going to be extracted three and a half minutes, right around there. And then you're going to take uh, the heat away, right? You're going to take it off the heat. And then at the base of that carafe, there's a filter. And then now all that coffee is getting, you know, the pressure at the bottom, you know, becomes negative pressure, creates suction, right? So now it's collapsed on itself and now it's wanting to pull everything from the top down, right? Uh, and it's going to suck all that or pull all that coffee through that filter and then down into the bottom. And at the top, you know, it's caught all the ground. So mm-hmm. you're going to take that top piece off. And then now the bottom bulb becomes a decanter. And then you're going to decant the coffee that came through the filter uh, into your cup. Hmm. Sounds really fun to wash. It's a, it's a process. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really is. It's probably the coolest way to make coffee yeah. in my book. I'm vi- I was visualizing it, and it sounds yeah. incredible. It, yeah, I mean, I was I was fascinated by it as yeah. as I watched it happen. Like maybe maybe not you know the process you're going to take on when you're trying to get the kids out the door to school <laughs> no. in the morning, but no. you know on yeah. a, on a Saturday when you're five years old uh, mm-hmm. reading the New York Times, uh, right. Sawyer, you know, yeah, maybe the siphon uh, going next to you. I feel like that's the number one. But like you know, I think I know myself probably a lot of folks like you want to make a pot of coffee in the morning. You're going to be drinking multiple cups of coffee mm-hmm. you might have multiple, multiple people yeah. you know so it's like you know yeah however many volume people. Thing. so like yeah. what's the the best volume process we're going to be able to you know accommodate me you know multiple people auto, but still auto gonna, drip that, auto i mean drip. that's going to be your your yeah. main you know you're going to get 12 cups out of that yeah right there really isn't 
like in terms of a pour over style, like a Chemex or something, mm-hmm. um, they're not going to be at that volume. You know, you, you might get two or three cups out of it. Would you go over that even like over like a larger press too? Then yeah, yeah. Like, uh, well, I mean, with auto brewers, like it's a nice like you know if you get a nice brewer, you're going to get a nicer cup of coffee, okay. right? If you go with a cheaper Mister Coffee or something, it's probably not going to be that great. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I would like in our kitchen we have Brevels. That's, okay, uh, Brevels is a brand for a brewer. Yeah, um, they're I think nicer. That's what we have two actually. Yeah, they're nicer and they use a lot of commercial parts. Like hmm. from like taken from like a Fetco or something like yeah. a commercial brewer. So the platform in which these things brew coffee is very similar to a commercial machine, right? So you're going to get that nicer cup of coffee, right, with them, uh, and then it kind of goes downhill. And there's other brands you can get too that'll be nicer, but those are the ones that I use. Okay, cool um, for an auto. Yeah, but up beyond that, I would probably do. Um, a Chemex or something. No, okay. to self, get rid of my Mr. Coffee. <laughs> yeah, Mark, no, I'm not, I'm not saying like, get oh, rid yeah, of that's it. That's what I have too, actually. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll have to check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm getting made fun of for reading the New York yeah. Times. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mark's pinky Mr. is about Rockefeller. Yeah. Mr. Rockefeller hey, over yeah. here. I, I enjoy it. It was a gift. It was a gift yeah. from my oh. father. Yeah. They, uh, if you want to make a, fun of that, Eric. A good coffee brewer is definitely still a good investment. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, speaking of Mr. Coffee, Eric, so we got... And I can't believe I interrupted this process, like self-sabotage, for goodness sakes. Yeah. I don't know, what is it, like 10 a.m.? We haven't had a cup yeah, of coffee I'm yet. I'm sitting here <laughs> yeah. about to See die. I'm hoping this yeah. water is like yeah. still at optimal brewing temperature. Well, I know. My... <laughs> okay, step one. So Let's this, run so through this the is, gamut This is dark here. timber gravity pack, so this is what you, Super light. you know, take. You know, heck, you can make a cup of coffee at your desk at work. If you yeah, want. so these are, uh, the gravity pack is a, a single-serve, pour-over-style coffee pack. So if you want to go hunting, car camping, you know, you're in the backcountry, you're hiking, whatever. You can take one of these with you, and you can actually get a drip coffee, a cup of drip coffee on the mountain without bringing in a Ziploc baggie full of grounds. Yep. And then, you know, that really smelly coffee brew sock thing that people bring, you know, okay. and they never mm-hmm. wash. Um, sure. And then, uh, or like a collapsible cone. Well, yeah, or even, and I, I'm just kind of looking at the concept here, you know, clean up. Right, super yep. easy. They're biodegradable. I was just going to ask that. So yeah. you just bury them like your TP or whatever, or if you got a fire going, just throw in the fire. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. This is, yeah, it smells amazing. That's the stuff. Yeah, it oh, smells pretty dear. good, right? <laughs> I think uh, this. These came off the line uh, Sunday, so these. Okay. Are, yeah, these are roasted on Sunday. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's Friday. For you know what? I don't know. And yeah. so, like, I don't want to halt this process let's oh, while man. we're doing He's this halt the i know but i want to talk about time because you talk yep. about time like you know once you roast a bean right so a green coffee bean yep. that's just been essentially i guess dried right cured, yeah you cured. want to get it down to 13 percent water uh, content for the curing process yeah. but that that'll stay stable for how long that's a tough question okay right? so stable is Meaning it's not molded or gone bad. Like not molded, gone bad, still good for roasting. You're yeah. going to get the product that you want out of it. You can you can roast coffees up to a couple of years, right? Well, but we don't. Okay. Yeah. So we'll use coffees that are fresh crop always, okay. right? And they come in grain pro bags. Yep. So they're now they have these high barrier bags that they're shipping coffee in. Um, so basically a year is what we want to use. Like when we're buying coffees, we're buying a year's worth. Okay. Right? And then that's it. And then once we're getting to the tail end of those, those lots that we're buying, then we're going to... We're already working on the next slot that's coming in. Gotcha. Right? So we're not buying coffees that are a year out and then forecasting our usage of those coffees through the year. Right. But coffee can and does get sold as aged Sumatra or something for up to five years. Okay. Yeah, or 10 years, some of this stuff. But then once you roast that coffee. Then that's when the clock really starts ticking. Right? Roasted coffee should, I mean, I always tell people to buy as much coffee as you're going to drink maximum for a month okay right don't buy two three four months at a time costco get the yeah, <laughs> yeah. and the stuff that's <laughs> the at drum <laughs> yeah and i don't want to bad mouth that stuff but a lot of that stuff's been sitting before it even goes there yeah oh sure. yeah right so you know we used to sell or i used to sell back in the day to uh, grocery you know with my last mm-hmm. uh, company and i know exactly how long that coffee that actually finally gets to the supermarket how old that coffee actually is before you know right before it gets there yeah interesting yeah but coffee you know like i like to drink coffees that are two weeks old you know maximum Mm -hmm. you know get it around there well Um, this is 
let's get this party yeah, we're, started. We're aging okay. this by the by yeah, yeah. minute. <laughs> we're losing time. So the gravity pack, what you're going to do is you're going to take it out of the package, um, and it's a filter system, so you're going to tear open the top and just get a perforated tear there. Step one. And complete. then there's these little... I like, to, I like to call them cardboard, but they're really not. They're like a hard paper, like a really thick paper. Little arms that come off the sides. So you're going to pull those out. Uh, you don't have to bend them forward, but I like to bend them forward because then it creates that little lip on the side that grabs the cup a little better. And you're just going to pull them over and place them over your cup, just like that. Easy, Mark. I know. Easy, easy success. <laughs> just like that. Okay, uh, and then we have this uh, container of water here. Let me open it up. Hopefully, there's still steam I coming out of there. I should just film this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, and I'm going to let one of you guys do the honors because I've made thousands of these. So well, um, maybe the guy more farthest away from the equipment. I was, I was going to say, you guys, we already went over my operating of the electronics, <laughs> so probably shouldn't pour water all over it. Okay, and you're just going to pour enough water in there to let it bloom. So we're actually going to see the bloom happen. So you can see how it swelled up and all those bubbles. Okay. okay keep going. And just kind of let it fill up. And you can see why we call them gravity packs. You know, yeah. Gravity's pulling that water through the coffee and through the filter. Yeah, it's I, interesting. It's kind of like a slightly slower, like, you know, you just kind of got to give it its time to fill up. And Yeah, because it's, it's a small system, right? So you can't add a ton of water there. So right. So the in and out, the, the you know, the water going in, the water coming out, the coffee coming out, mm -hmm. it's fairly... Mm -hmm. fairly rapid because it's a smaller system but when but it's quicker than a regular drip machine you know? right yeah or even a regular pour over sure yeah it's quicker and when you're watching like it's almost like are we watching that bloom take place yeah like, you're multiple seeing times that then? all that on top there it, it, it doesn't hang around as long because uh it's a smaller brewing system so mm -hmm. it's gonna it's gonna leave there pretty quick but you're actually seeing a lot of that bloom there I have a couple quick questions while we wait for this, just yeah. because, like, in listening to you talk, I can tell you're incredibly passionate about yeah. coffee. Yeah. And I just want to get as many of the tips for people listening out of you as we can. One question typically you get at a, I guess, nicer coffee shop is um, natural versus washed. Mm -hmm. Can you talk yeah, about that, that was, difference? Yeah, uh, that was part of the process, the, so mm -hmm. the natural process, right? It's a good question, yeah, because I wanted to touch back on that. So you have natural process coffees, right, which are which are dried with the cherry on in the sun. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have a pulp natural coffee, right, which the cherries go to the mill and they're pulped, yep. meaning that they squeeze that seed out that still has the juice on there and the husk on there and the silver skin, you know, the parchment, and then that goes out to the patio to be dried without washing it. Okay. Right. So that will still have a fruit note to it or a fruit flavor to it, but it's not going to be as pungent or as forward as a natural will be. It'll also be more consistent in terms of the bean itself, right? In terms of roasting, it'll roast a little more consistent than a natural will. Okay. Right. Because the curing is a little bit not as consistent as with a natural than yeah. like a pulp natural. And then you have a washed, right? Where they go and they, they'll pulp the coffee, right? They'll pulp it out of the, the cherry and out of the mucilage and it'll go into a trough, right? Mm -hmm. And in the trough, it'll go down these little channels uh, or sometimes they just have a tub depending on how the, how the mill is. And they're raking it and, and agitating it and washing that coffee and they're washing all that off. Uh, and then that coffee is going to be more delicate. It's not going to have that blueberry. It's not going to have that cherry note, strawberry, yeah. things like that that you'll get in the coffee. Typically, you'll have more of a lemon, more of a floral, right. things like that. Okay. Or, a heavy, or if it's like a heavy chocolate mm -hmm. or something with a washed coffee. So it's really a taste preference thing. Yeah. And like a lot of our blends are uh, very heavy on the washed, right? Because we want something, uh, one that's going to score really high. Right, it's more of complex in mm -hmm. terms of its flavor, uh, and one that's going to roast well. Right, okay. so that typically won't we won't go over ten percent in a natural in any blend. Okay, because I think it's a little bit of your brain tricking you. Because the first time I heard that, I was like, "Well, natural sounds like right. It's like natural. It's like like it's somehow sounds like, like oh, they should be sold sanitizing at, it. You know, yeah, right. organic section of yeah, Whole Foods or yeah. something. Right. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's just a process. My other question is hearing you talk about some of the mechanisms you use, you, you use your favorite way to prepare coffee. It, it just seems like you like coffee in like it's rawest form. Yeah. Like water coffee. How do you feel about kind of the influx of coffee and beer, coffee and cooking kind of, some people like use it. it on rubs for steaks. Yeah. Like, I like, do you feel I like different, a, uh, you know, different avenues, people to, to drink or eat coffee. I like that. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm a 
big proponent of that, like working it into like other things mm -hmm. in your culinary cookbook or repertoire is use it as a rub or use it uh, as a, some sort of marinade, you know, put it in that uh, or in a beer. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, also, we've done a lot of we've done a lot of coffee ports, uh, a lot of stouts, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. I'm not a huge proponent in flavored coffee. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. yep. Anytime you're uh, a coffee company's putting flavorings in their coffee, the flavorings are just chemicals. Right. It's just a chemical. Yeah. And the way they do that is think of like a big cement mixer. So the coffee comes out of the roaster, they take it over, they throw it in a cement mixer, and they take buckets of flavoring, and they just toss the buckets of flavoring in the mixer, and it just rolls it around, yeah. coats the coffee, and then they put it in a bag and send it out. And there's really no natural way to do that. So if you want to flavor your coffee, the preferred way would be to do it after the fact. Yeah, like or a, use a like a, or yeah, use a really nice syrup. Like a, like a basic nice sugar syrup would be like a Monin. You know, something like that. And there's a lot of other nicer ones from there. But it really, uh, you know, honey is a good one to put in there. Oh, uh, sure. If you want to put yep. sugar yeah. in there or whatever. And I'm not going to take any, you know, away from anybody if they want to put, uh, like, mm -hmm. a flavoring in there. Right? Do what you want. Do, mm -hmm. ha drink how you want to drink your coffee, right? There's My nose is in the up in the air. But, um, but the chemicals that go into it, I'm not a fan of. Man, there's just so much that goes into it, you know? I mean, it's like a staple. I mean, it's a staple of all of our every day, you know? And I yeah. think in some ways you don't think about it. I mean, you think about it because you get up, you enjoy it, and yep. it's part of your day. And But, like, beyond that, you know, and just, like, just the different variables that go into it. And and it's something I'll invest into. Like, a good coffee for me used to be, like, a weekend thing. But it's really become something, like, I prioritize and invest in now. Like, I want good coffee every day. Yeah, life's too short, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. I'll still drink bad coffee every now and then. Yeah. Just to, like keep myself in check <laughs> yeah yeah you cleanse know. the palate it yeah. really is reset like you reset you know what's out there yeah. and you're like all right i gotta get over here well you the know because you'll take it for granted sometimes yeah. you drink coffee like that for years and years and years i'll still go to the gas station yeah yeah and then take a few steps and like nope yeah well <laughs> the, neat, the neat thing with like these gravity packs is you got something that you can bring into the field with you and like for your mood uh -huh. you know just mm -hmm. like that well, does wonders that's you know? my thing like, I can't do a, a pre-workout on the mountain. I can't yep. do those type of things, but they're good for people. You know, like, mm -hmm. they, you know, they help a lot of people. Right. I have to have coffee. Yeah. That's it's not so much the caffeine. It's what it does to my brain. Yeah. Right. right. There's, like, a neural thing that's going on that, like, all of a sudden I'm looking through rose-colored glasses. You know what I mean? And, yeah. like, my day is just better. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a morale booster. It really too. is. Yeah. Like, I if mean, you want to spend more time in the woods, more, mm -hmm. or, you know, for guys that are deer hunting, more time in a tree stand like yep. having something like this super easy you know it's gonna keep you in the field longer and you know that'll make you more successful absolutely Dopa dopamine man yeah yeah it makes is, a, it, makes, is a, it makes the world go around <laughs> i didn't want to say that's a, it's a dopamine dump. <laughs> we're not just talking yeah. about drugs yeah <laughs> drink more coffee shoot more bucks that's right yeah <laughs> no uh you know like my you know i do a lot of uh, backcountry hunting is pretty much all we do and you know i set my I used to have a jet bowl and now I have an MSR, but yeah, uh, I set it right next to my pad and yep. my, in my sleeping bag, and I won't leave that sleeping bag until that coffee is done and I'm drinking it. And then God, like, now I'm coming amazing. out of my bag and like now I'm getting everything ready. But like, yep. my day up there does not start until that coffee's done. And, yep. and I'm there's something it. to be said about watching this process that's going on right in front of me right now in a tent out in the middle of the woods. Yep. Well, then you unzip, walk yep. right out yep. into yep. it with exactly. the ready to go, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, you're not standing around. One more pour and then it's going to you, to Marco. Go. You know, you talk about, and at least for me, like it's not even necessarily like a, a morning thing. You know, I mean, it is a morning thing when I'm in the field, mm -hmm. but man, like, you a know, midday a midday thing. break yeah. or if yeah. you've been like glassing forever yeah. and it's like cold out and you're just like, yeah. like oh, let's, yeah. let's make a cup of coffee. Yeah. And yeah. November swear, mule deer. Yeah. 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 And like, it's such a treat. Yep. And like you said, like maybe it's a dopamine bump too or a morale booster, but like there is something about making coffee in the middle of nowhere when it's like frosty out that yeah. just oh, feels 100%. it's like Good. that comfort from home yes. and you've got it on the mountain and it's just like yes yep like you're not like powering through it just because you need it yeah you're like enjoying it, it. it yeah exactly it like it ranks right up there with some of my favorite memories from the trip yep. yeah like yeah. Mm -hmm. That cooking, and then obviously, like you know, the hunt itself. But like that, yeah. There's that is part of the experience, mm -hmm. no doubt. Yeah, like when we're like, let's say mule deer hunting, we're doing a lot of sitting. 
right? Right. We've got them in our pack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll just make them all day. Yeah. You know, if you have our vapor pack, which is our uh, instant line, we have the Mount Baker Mocha version. Those are kind of nice too. If you're up there, you don't really yeah. need water. We're, mm-hmm. you can just pour it in your mouth. Yeah. And swish a little water around, and you're you're you're, you're done. But so, as someone who appreciates like a really good cup of coffee, and you're super passionate about it, what did the process look like from working with the past company and like really liking really great coffee and wanting to share great coffee and putting that in a package and keeping the same quality to something that you can use in a tent? It's hard. Yeah, to keep that along the same line going, Mm -hmm. right? Because one, uh, it's pre-ground, right? So it's, you know, if if you're going to be a real snob about coffee, you want to keep it as a whole bean, okay? right? But with these things, you know, we do a a small nitrogen injection. So we're going to get rid of the oxygen and put a little nitrogen in there. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to stop the decomposition process or the aging process of the coffee. So you're going to get a higher grade coffee, uh, end product with them. That's really what I was wondering. That is super interesting because yeah. I never would have thought right. something like, yeah, mm-hmm. it's crazy. Yeah. So if you take out the oxygen from the coffee, oxygen was what starts and what, you know, decomp, you know, decomposes things, right? It's oxygen mm-hmm. basically. That's why things in space can be there forever. Yeah. Right? Unchanged, I guess. But, uh, yeah. So if you take that out, then you're just stopping that process and then once you open it up, though, then it's accelerated. Go right time. now, it's uh, now it's oxygen starved. Yeah, right. And you better use it, or it's going to go not bad quickly, but it'll it'll get back to where okay. you'll want it uh, fairly quick. So once you open that package in the mountain, you better be brewing mm-hmm. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I'm getting there. I think there's just enough water. No, to no, no. I'll, I'll, I've already had. You can. I'll be all right. You've had some of this before. Yeah, I've had <laughs> one or two of them. All right. Yeah, I'll leave them up to you guys. Don't worry about it. You know what, though? Part of that was, like, it's the social part, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I was like, I want you, to, I want to have a cup of coffee with you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I guess, what inspired you to kind of go on this That's path? question. <laughs> go on this path to kind of put it, this in a, package it, make it in a way that people can enjoy it out there. Yeah. So, like, when I started, when I first started my, my very first company, I was 20, right? Saved up all my money, bought an espresso cart, found a location. And yeah. Then I opened up two more by the time I was 22 in downtown Seattle or whatever, and then, you know went to help develop another bigger company, but huh. it was always that cafe style. Right. And it was always that sort of that third wave coffee shop stuff. But in, in my soul, I was always like, I want to create this, another company that's going to be more true to what I'm doing. You know, what I like to do. Right. So I wanted to start a, you know, the first ever kind of hunting coffee brand. Yeah. Right. And then within that brand, I was like, okay, so how am I going to get my product from us and get people to use it on the mountain? Right. Right. So how do I bridge that gap? Because not everybody just want to take a 12 ounce bag and stuff it in their pack and yeah. take the mountain. Right. So then I started thinking of products that would, that would help facilitate that and help ease the, ease the process of having good coffee in the mountain. So we started with the ascent pack, which is more of a full, full immersion style pack, similar to this. It just doesn't have the arms. You don't rip it open. You just kind of drop it in. Yep. Right. And it just leaches out mm-hmm. uh, similar to like how a French piss works. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then we started uh, looking at, other ways to do it how do we do like a drip coffee style Mm -hmm. right start covering the bases and how do we do like more of the instant stuff and like the guys who want to just dump and stir Mm -hmm. uh, don't Mm -hmm. they want to go stoveless they can just use cold water yeah you know okay like that so that's kind of what spawned all the these products and we have a lot more products are going to be coming out too that are really cool (laughs) Uh, interesting never been seen before so and are, are you limited in the type of beans that you can use with the way that this is set up or Mm -hmm. is it you can use any anything you you want that's cool uh well our coffee's in it right Mm -hmm. i mean you can't add any more uh, right right or anything right right yeah i'm ready i'm ready okay so uh just take them out i guess you can set them on there or whatever yeah I've never seen anybody do, pull do them up get, like that. Do you give this a... That's the first time I've ever seen that's that. The, that's the suitcase. <laughs> I told, method. I told yeah. you, dog, I don't play around when it comes to coffee. I'm going to oh, steal you. that, man. That's like little handles. Yeah, that was that was seamless right back into the bag. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was just like a little carry bag. Yeah, and we have like... So the filter, the filter system is, is biodegradable. You know, obviously the outside high barrier packages. Yeah. But moving forward, we're actually moving into a... That's great. A, a full biodegradable packaging, so... You know, if there are litter bugs that buy our product, yeah, you know, yeah, we'll do our part into making sure that oh, man. that at some point is going away. Hmm. That's cool. So the, it's mic- funny, the I micro even... garbage and the micro trash is going to yeah. be going away from us. Huh. Cool. 
Cool. That yeah. makes sense. Like it didn't cross my mind that that would be a problem, but I guess I could see that. Potentially. Yeah, most guys are good. Like all the guys I hunt with, you know, yeah. all our trash goes right back in our pack. But I, yep. I can't speak for everybody. Right. You know. Right. So I'm gonna try to do something that. You know. uh, and errant wind blows and. Yeah. You know. Exactly. Or you know, like you always see like uh, other coffee companies cups everywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere on the ground. Yep. You know, and I just I don't want people to be going somewhere and seeing our trash on the ground. That's not. That's not the advertising you're looking for. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. What's the optimal in the field vessel for coffee, in your opinion? Well, man, it's tough. You have the tin cups, right? Yeah. You got the little tin cups, yep. little titanium cups. That's what I've cups. always used. The only problem with those is they get hot and they burn your lip. Yeah. Right? Okay, right. Yeah. So you, they have uh, other smaller style cups that have like a neoprene around them or something. Typically, what we're doing is we're using our jet boils or our, you know, okay. our, our other brewing styles. You know, these will stretch over quite a bit yeah um, oh okay gotcha you know but for the gravity packs you know we'll use a little just little titanium cups uh, it's called a uh what's the brand of like those? the snow peak or snow something? peaks yeah we yeah. use snow peaks okay yeah. and they do a pretty good job yeah but our scent packs and our instant stuff you can just use your jet oil or nice you know that's for like mo- most of the guys that buy those are the like ultra light guys who don't want to bring cups they don't yeah. want to bring extra stuff that's what they use because they'll just boil the water, let it come off the roll, and you know it's right at about 200 degrees. Right. You know, it's dropping, and then they're going to be brewing their coffee in it. Okay. Awesome. Well, earlier, I don't know if we were recording yet or not, but we're talking about coffee, and I've drank a lot of coffee in my life, and I've had drip coffee, press coffee, this coffee, and then Sir had asked Tony, like, what, you know, and he's like, oh, I like a pour over. So this is, in fact, this is pour over. This is yeah. my first pour over. Really oh, nice. <laughs> All right. We did it. We're yeah. doing it, everybody. <laughs> Love was it. it. Was this a, was this like a coffee intervention? Getting yeah. you on the right path in life. Mm-hmm. Here goes. All right. Cheers, Cheers fellas. fellas. All right. Oh man. Yep. Good. Mm-hmm. Pass the test. That's a good cup of coffee. Oh man. And it's man. a it's like a it's like a single serve. Put it in your backpack coffee. Yeah. Yep. That you is know. awesome. Man, I just like that. I like the option to have really nice things when you're out yeah. in the woods. It's yeah. a, you buy nice gear. Mm-hmm. You buy nice rifles. You buy nice optics, right? Vortex optics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, why would you just bring in some junky coffee? Especially yeah. if you really like coffee, why would you yeah. give that up? I did, it just always boggled, like, it like blew my mind why guys would spend so much money on boots and gear and like all this stuff. Even their food, they're you know they're like researching. I was just going to bring that up. Yeah, like yeah, this is food to me. It, it absolutely. You know what I mean? Guys yep. are balking about like, you know other freeze dried brands, and it's like then they're pulling out you know some very bottom shelf brand of coffee yeah. on their hunt. Yeah, and like just instant like instant stuff or whatever. You know, yeah. I could see the utilitarian side of it, right? But it's like yeah. if I'm out, like you know, I'll go hunt Idaho. You know, those trips aren't cheap. You yeah. know, and I, like I want to have a good time and I want to live. And do the things I want to do on the mountain. And how Preach easy yeah. how easy this is. Yeah. There is a lot of human error that can go into the instant stuff. Yeah. I a couple years ago mm-hmm. made my dad a cup of instant coffee mm-hmm. on a hunt and I Damn like my, killed him. I like my coffee way stronger than my dad likes his <laughs> and accidentally got it switched. And admittedly the one that I poured <laughs> intended for myself was way too strong. Yeah. That thing looked like it had a head of root beer on it or oh, something no. like that. And my dad took a sip of that. And he was ready to like shoot to the moon. He had to, you know, sedate himself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> around yeah, 10 instant. Uh, instant. There's a lot of like you're, you're rehydrating coffee solubles. Yeah. You know, so like it's it can get a lot of variables. Western there. pretty quick. On, yeah, the, the amount of caffeine is in that stuff. I, I lived a nightmare visiting my mom a couple of years ago. I got to her house. We got there late at night, and yeah. You know, two hour time difference, and we're used to getting up with the kids, so we're up at like mm-hmm. zero in the morning. You know, I'm like, oh god, I need a cup of coffee, and she's got a note on the coffee machine, and it says two scoops equals ten cups of coffee. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, incorrect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it equals tea. Wrong. And then yeah. all I can find is decaf, and I'm like, <laughs> somebody like pinch me or mm-hmm. just yeah. end it because yep. I'm not in a good place right now. Yeah, but luckily. I was able to overcome, but that was. People made fun of Eric and I. Would, we used to work together yeah. at a, in a previous life, and we would make like motor oil, <laughs> yeah. like red eye, yeah, like like it'll and, mess you up. And I, <laughs> I really enjoy that. Like, would you? Mm-hmm. I mean, do you do you like that, or do you like 
like, like what's your optimal ratios, like, like soluble to water ratios, like how strong it is? Like, yeah. Or do you like, like the a consist real... the viscosity of like the coffee itself? Do you like, like it gets a little sludgy? Yeah. <laughs> it's, I so guess the question. I, it, I do and I don't. Like, if it's a lighter coffee, I'll take right. go a little heavier. Yeah. You know, but really, like, I'll be checking. Like, I can look at that and check and see where, yeah. it's, where it's at yeah. Yeah, in terms of like, you know, if you tip the coffee cup over. And you see the dark line, mm-hmm. yep. you see the light line, and it starts to get lighter, lighter, lighter as it hits the edge of the mug. Mm-hmm. So I know that spacing and that right there tells me that that's pretty spot on for the size of the oh. mug. Interesting. So wow. I'm going to look at that and learn something. New yeah, that's how you that visually one. can check and see how, like, like uh, in terms of, like, you know, soluble coffee to water ratio just by looking at yeah. it. That's yeah. how you can. Just kind of like that little halo that's around yeah, the yeah. edge. Yeah, tip then. it, tip it to the, till the coffee goes to the edge of the mug and see how far, okay. how far back that light line oh, that's goes. that's interesting. And I'll then how it like, gets darker. Yeah. If that dark line is right at the edge of the cup, like, right at the lip of the cup, that's, that's probably has too much. That's co- levitation. Yeah, that's okay. too much. Yep coffee solubles to water yeah yep. well and then we didn't even talk you know about light r- light roast versus dark roast or I decaf think, like, or those are or, we, or we decaf. Won't talk oh, about that i don't know <laughs> um, I what did you say beliefs. yeah yeah uh, <laughs> who is she uh it's america <laughs> yeah uh, but so like at least you know when i started drinking like better coffee right like i was like oh dark roast is like fancier and that's what you want but as i learned a little bit more about it like it sounds like you know s- Maybe not always, but like the lighter roasts are actually where, where you're going to get some of those more finite like flavor notes oh, yeah. out of the coffee. Yeah. So like uh, you know, as the roasting process sort of goes on from green to yellow to cinnamon in color, right? Mm-hmm. As it yeah. goes, the, the spectrum of color. Yeah. Um, then you start to get into what I call the drinkable stage. Right? Yeah. And that's what we call city, full city, yep. city plus plus. You know. So coffees that are right at that full city, yeah, roast profile, which is light, medium light. Mm-hmm. you're going to get all those delicate flavors, right? So all the stuff that would be gone or masked by a dark roast. Right. Because with the dark roast, all you're tasting is smoke and carbon and, you know, you know all that stuff that you get. You're, you're tasting the roast right. style. You're not really tasting the coffee itself. So as you get lighter in roast, then you start to pull out those very distinct okay. flavors of where they're grown. Mm-hmm. You know, what makes that coffee unique? Yeah. And they'll start to come out as the coffee gets light. So, like, with us, yeah, we have the double barrel blend, and, yeah, it's a little bit darker, but it's not dark. It's not going to be French roasted coffee. It's going to be a city plus plus, meaning that we're taking that roast in its roast, you know, into the process of roasting. Uh, We're bringing it to almost there, right? We call it sweaty coffee. We're bringing it to almost sweaty coffee, meaning the oils on the that outside of the hot. coffee. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we're not we're not taking it there. We're going to end that process. We're going to get it out of the roaster mm-hmm. into the cooling tray. And we're going to air quench it to okay. stop the roasting process. So you're going to get that. You're going to get what most people like out of a dark roast is that kind of dark roast flavor. But you're still going to get those distinct flavors okay. for the most part of the coffee. Right, right. It's almost yeah. kind of like a. But you're not going to taste that smoke and bitter and carbon. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. We buy nice coffees. We source nice coffees. There's no point in us, like, roasting them dark where you can't taste the coffee. Right. That made them unique. It made them want to buy us to begin with. Yeah. Right. And a lot of time you hear, like, the amount of caffeine in a certain coffee. Like, does that is that directly tied to the kind of the flavor profiles Absolutely. that you'll see? Absolutely. There's more caffeine in lighter roasted coffees than there is in darker roasted coffees. Okay. Okay. Dark, coffee like has, <laughs> dark coffee has, percentage-wise, as it's, it's you know, Stacked and stacked and yeah. stacks. It has like thirty percent less coffee. Exactly. Right. I think you'd yeah. think the opposite if you didn't know anything mm-hmm. about it. Like that's most what people, I that's a misconception. So they like that. I want this dark, strong, make your hair stand up coffee. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, really, no. You're getting less caffeine in that coffee. But you're what only you are getting, yourself, people. Yeah, yeah, you're getting more carbon. And a lot of times with car- with people, that car- more carbon in the coffee makes you feel like there's more caffeine in it hmm. in a way it make it it'll make your stomach feel like really? there's caffeine in it, like upset antsy feeling yeah poop god I, <laughs> so there's Dude, white i just yeah. love coffee so much yeah, I man i love it so there's white coffee <laughs> yeah which yeah. is a thing right and, you know we do do it for a few of our locals that actually just come pick it up because i don't really like doing it but that stuff has like 70 percent more yeah. caffeine than 
any of it. And it's, oh, wow. Yeah, because you have green coffee, which has 100% of the caffeine it's ever going to have. Yeah. As the roast process goes on, you're, you're evaporating that coffee yeah. mm-hmm. out of, or out of that caffeine out of the coffee. Because coffee roasting is just a, it's just a process of dehydration. You're dehydrating okay. the coffee. Right. Right. Browning it. Yeah. What's the flavor we, profile of that white coffee then, though? I, I don't never drink it. Okay. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I do it as a favor for yeah. somebody who does uh, some Not work. into the cat stuff? Not you into the like coffee? You just see people in alleys passed out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> white, white coffee broken right by them. Yeah. 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 We, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say it's not bad. Right. right. I just, I've never really drank yeah. it. Because I know, you know, like in, within cupping coffees, and I know when they're on that lighter end, there's some, the flavors that I don't typically care for or yeah. like are sought after grassy herby flavors yeah okay right, right. yeah like i, can I i'm that. not a big fan of that kind of a flavor so like i just it's not my thing yeah right mm-hmm. but it could be somebody else's thing and it's clearly their thing yeah you know man we just saw the power of coffee right there in a nutshell <laughs> when you <laughs> drank that and we're like i love it we were giving you crap about about your, your mood the other day Dude, and I've been, now it's like you're a new man yeah. oh, pos- <laughs> positivity levels are through yeah. the roof right now <laughs> we flew into salt lake and i was being i was being negative man i was harshing the vibe and now it's like oh, the world is in balance right it's like everything is good in the world with your first sip of coffee Thank you. Oh, man. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Anytime, yeah. guys. Thank you, Tony. You've propelled yep. our Friday, our Valentine's Day into yep. a new And you level. got some uh, free mugs out of it? <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. It, it will be so a happy much. Valentine's oh, Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I forgot it was Valentine's Day today. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. be your Valentine. All right. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> let's, make this a, let's make this a long-term thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we should do this again. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, we appreciate it, man. I, yeah, I it was it, fun. Man. We okay. usually end, wrap these up with last calls. Do you have any last calls, anyone? I mean, the, the, my last call is this. Thanks for uh, enlightening us on yeah. all the different facets of coffee. Uh, this is absolutely delicious. I yep. know I feel better. Mm-hmm. and uh, You are better. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Tony. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Super fascinating. I, happy to be on here, guys, and I'm, ha- and I'm thankful you guys asked me to do it. You're a great group of guys, and I love talking to you. Awesome, man. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. Eric, what about you? Man, I don't know. Believe in the power of coffee is, is a pretty <laughs> simple way to sum this up for me. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Believe in the power of the roast. I think the biggest thing for me is the last podcast I was on was the burrito cook-off. And, like, the two take-homes were, one, one learn about the food that you're eating or drink that you're drinking, and, two, like, try new things and don't be afraid to – outwardly like nice yep. things yeah i think people foo-foo that i yeah. think even sometimes in this industry although you'll be talking about how much you like food or like mm-hmm. a certain type if you're a foodie um and there's almost this like aversion to liking nice or it's things. Like it's a, like a generational thing yeah like they're, yeah know. like it's not masculine yeah to like, exactly you know, enjoy yeah. those things yeah. that are just yeah. enjoyable yeah I mean, right tony you said it man life's too short yeah drink <laughs> that's good, right drink good coffee eat good steak yep. like Look through good optics, drink good coffee. Yeah, exactly. You know. Live your best life, drink dark timber. That's right. But yeah, thank you. I love oh, learning about you. this stuff. I feel like I've That's just the tip of the time. iceberg, too. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, we can talk about oh all types of stuff two. later. Yeah. yeah. I'm in. Awesome, man. As Part two you... from the mountain. If, <laughs> That's right. It, yeah. I, you guys know in, where to find us. In the field use. If Tony's bringing the coffee, I'm in. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. Leave us a review or comment down below. We want to hear what you have to say about the show, maybe what you like, maybe what you didn't like, so that way we can make these podcasts as good as they can be. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'll be posting about each episode released, so that way you can go back, find these things, maybe grab a little nugget of information that you can take with you to the range, out in the field, or uh, maybe to the kitchen if we're talking about some good food. So, again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.